Good morning, friends. Uh, uh, it is always a privilege to be with this August uh, audience. Uh, now, after several years of waiting, ultimately we have come to a stage where uh, DPDPB has become DPDPA. That is, the act, uh, the bill has been passed not only by the parliament, two houses, but also it has obtained the signature of the president. So we now can start calling it as data, a digital personal data protection act 2023, which will be the official name. In fact, at FDPPI, we are treating this next fortnight and up to the end of this month as, is a, as a carnival time. Um, because everybody is uh, very happy that our long wait has come uh, to some kind of a fruition. So that's why we call this as a period of DPDPA carnival as far as uh, FDPPA is concerned. Uh, Vikas has uh, briefly introduced me and most of you may be aware, um, but uh, uh, anyway, most of you know that I started my career as a banker and then switched over to a cyber law consultancy and uh, cyber law itself evolved uh, with uh, data protection as one of the important segments. Uh, initially, I used to handle HIPAA related activities uh, which was related to privacy and then um, the Information Technology Act itself got transformed into the Indian Data Protection Act and of course um, after the uh, Supreme Court stated that there is a need to consider the privacy as a fundamental right. There has been a lot of activities uh, in the government side and um, initially we had a bill called PDPB 2018, then it became 19, then it became 2021 uh, and now the PDP, uh, uh, DPDP um, B. Throughout this process, we have been trying to work at um, FDPPI to develop skill sets uh, through various certified data auditor programs, which we continue even now. In fact, we started before the act came. So many people were wondering why we should start training before the act comes. But now people will understand that the years of preparation was actually essential for us to actually react positively when the new law comes. We also took the freedom to suggest a specific uh, framework which we called as uh, Personal Data Protection Standard of India, PDPSI. Now, of course, we are trying to call it as uh, Personal Data Protection Compliance Standard of India, uh, which uh, should be a framework for organizations to implement what DPDPA is uh, trying to suggest, taking into account the good practices which are prevalent worldwide, uh, maybe in the form of ISO 27701 uh, with reference to GDPR, maybe the COVID, which is uh, the ISACA version of a, a framework, maybe the NIST framework. All these frameworks have been developed with a purpose of uh, making compliance easy. So what we have tried to do is we try to uh, dovetail the compliance framework to the Indian requirement and that is what the PDP CSI is trying to do. Additionally, we have also created a data disputes management uh, platform and very recently we also tried to create uh, a Indian National Register of Data Protection Professionals. So on the one hand, we are developing the skill sets. On the other hand, we are creating the um, uh, uh, particular uh, recognition in the form of Indian National uh, Register for Data Protection Professionals. We have also created, as some of you are aware, uh, you can say it is in the process of development, um, an exchange platform where professionals can offer their services and companies can avail their services. So tomorrow, if 100 companies have to look for data auditors, maybe this platform will be the place where they can find matching uh, data auditors. So just as in the case of uh, an online arbitration platform, you have got uh, 
the lawyers accredited to the platform on the one side and the dispute uh, um, I mean, resolution seeking persons coming to the platform and asking for oh, who will be able to resolve my um, problem. We have created a skills exchange platform uh, under FDPC, that is Federation of Data Protection um, Consultants in India, and we are trying to um, use that as part of uh, our uh, of, uh, uh, framework. So these are some of the things which we are uh, are doing now. And uh, with that, uh, if we now come to this data protection um, uh, act, which the government has introduced, uh, we must first appreciate what will be the impact of this DPDPA on the information security professionals. I believe most of you are uh, IS professionals, CISOs, maybe CTOs. So the first thing which should strike your mind is how does this affect me? Now we all know that DPDPA will introduce uh, two new professional positions with which the organization will uh, respond. One is an employee position, which is the data protection officer who will be based in India. Presently, of course, the access this is required for significant data fiduciaries only, uh, but other organizations may need to have a position like a compliance officer uh, with similar functionality, but not a full fledged DPO. Now, these DPOs are expected to represent the significant data fiduciary when it comes to the regulatory authority. Also, it, he, the particular person designated as DPO will be the single point contact for grievance redressal mechanism, which means that all the data principles who are dealing with that organization will look at the DPO as the person to whom they have to dump whatever complaints they have. Therefore, this position of DPO is considered as a very important position in the organization. And um, in addition to this, the act uh, speaks of what is called data auditors. Data auditors are also appointed by an organization, of course, the significant data fiduciary. And the purpose of uh, appointing somebody as a data auditor is as an external auditor who would conduct maybe periodical audits. Uh, earlier, we used to talk of something called concurrent audit. So either a quarterly audit or an annual audit in which the organization's compliance to data protection law will be assessed by this data auditor. He is not a financial auditor. Uh, in fact, the statutory financial auditors would not be capable of handling this data audit because data audit is an audit for compliance to the different provisions of the data protection law. So that data auditor will be a consultant. So it is more an entrepreneurial job. I'm sure many of you who have already reached senior positions perhaps should think of uh, uh, engaging yourself as data auditors in due course. Maybe it will take at least a year for this kind of uh, an activity to uh, mature um, because the implementation of the act itself, government is going to give some time. Probably um, they may give up to one year time. Yesterday we had an interaction with the minister uh, Rajiv Chandrasekhar face to face in Bangalore. One of the things he was uh, saying is that they will give comfortably time for organizations to um, start moving into compliance and uh, they may actually have different time scales for large organizations and SMEs. Um, many of us are aware that even when HIPAA came in USA, these, uh, it came in 1996, but up to 2003, for seven years, the implementation was going on and the SMEs were the last to on, be onboarded into mandatory compliance. So India also may adopt a similar process where big tech companies may have to comply within the next uh, uh, six to nine months, maybe the others may be given a little more 
uh, time. So that is what is uh, likely to happen. So data auditors will be in demand um, sooner or uh, later. If the demand for data protection officers itself is large enough to absorb the current number of professionals available in the market, you may see that there will not be many people available outside the job area. Today, there are many people who have come to FDPPI and uh, they have all uh, got uh, lucrative jobs uh, somewhere uh, else. So there has been a migration from independent consultancy to jobs because the job of a data protection officer is quite lucrative, which means that initial crop of professionals who are good in this position would be absorbed as uh, employees of organizations. And I feel that there will be death of independent consultants who can take up the role of data auditors. So, but after six to nine months, perhaps uh, some of these people who have been DPOs will feel it is more lucrative to have an independent um, consultancy position. And I'm sure all of you need to look at that kind of a possibility. But when we look at this uh, DPO position in an organization, in the earlier version, there was a clear mention that DPO will be a key management professional, KMP as per the uh, Companies Act. Uh, now they have not made a mention of it. Uh, the only condition they have mentioned is, of course, uh, that he should be based in India, which means that the MNCs which are uh, operating with a DPO sitting abroad, probably in the GDPR area, will have to think of designating one person in India as the DPO. So which means that all those MNCs will have to find a DPO in the Indian uh, area. Uh, so that is one of the requirements. Otherwise, um, it is expected that this DPO is close to the board, uh, which essentially means that he is an individual responsible to the board of directors directly, unlike uh, other officials who may be reporting to a CRO or even to the CEO. Now, we are talking of the DPO's position being responsible to the board of directors. That itself will essentially mean that this DPO will be more or less like a key management uh, person and uh, he will therefore enjoy a status which could be higher than many of the CXOs today in the uh, organization. There are many organizations who would perhaps give a concurrent title of DPO to their existing CISOs and others. And many of the people tell me that this is what is going to happen for the next couple of years. I'm sure that companies will take that op I mean, option uh, because uh, they would like to have somebody designated. But uh, we know that in the GDPR uh, scenario, there have been instances where supervisory authorities have put fines on organizations for not having an independent data protection officer. In fact, in that uh, context, they have even disallowed or uh, uh, provided for fines for an organization which had designated the chief compliance officer as the DPO. Say we expect that the chief compliance officer is uh, well versed with the law, so they should be able to fulfill the requirements of uh, the data protection officer. But for whatever reason, in that particular case, uh, the uh, supervisory authority felt that CCP, that is the uh, compliance officer, also cannot concurrently hold the DPO position. If the same attitude is taken in India, we are expecting that these concurrent designations will have to uh, be uh, taken off sooner or later and there has to be an independent DPO. And of course, in large organizations, there will definitely be enough work for the DPO. Uh, first of all, to keep track of the changes which are happening and also to monitor the developments which are happening within the organization, conduct periodical audits and once in a year deal with the data auditor. All these are uh, issues which uh, consume a lot of time. So I suppose most of the companies will opt for independent 
DPO. Therefore, DPO career uh, is something we can look forward to as a new career. Um, and I have also stated this earlier also that uh, this is a career which even CSOs has to aspire and adopt. Some of you may not like that statement, um, but I think that is going to happen in a couple of years. Today, the people who are more proficient in law, they are trying to assume the positions of DPO. But as you all know, the DPO's position is a techno legal position. In addition, it is also uh, having the requirement of the managerial skills. So the leaders who have techno legal skills in an organization are the persons who are going to make ideal DPOs. So CISOs also can grow into that position. The C uh, compliance officers also can grow into that position and this competition will be there in the organizations. I hope all of you will appreciate this and then um, uh, use whatever opportunities uh, come. Now, in order to help these DPOs, uh, FDPPA is developing an end-to-end -end service that uh, which includes uh, the certification programs that everybody is doing now actually. Um, I don't uh, see any reason why people should opt for uh, international certifications if they want to serve in India because you need to be proficient in India. Um, second, we, the, our uh, framework will be a guidance for internal implementation in addition to also being a standard for uh, certification outside. And I would like most of you to actually look at this uh, uh, Indian National uh, Register uh, and uh, register yourself there if possible and use the exchange platform so that sooner or later all of you will take advantage of this DPDPEA. Now, whether you are a technical person or a legal person, it is essential that if you are a DPO, you must be thorough with the legal aspects which are there in the data protection law. That is the objective of today's uh, uh, discussion. We are, of course, today having the 44 sections of this data protection law, which is much, much simpler than what was there earlier with 98 sections um, and GDPR, which has got 99 articles. So comparatively, it should be easier for technology persons to understand this law. In fact, uh, Mr. Rajiv Chandrasekhar and others repeatedly say that we have made lawyers jobless because we have made it so simple. And uh, to some extent, it is uh, also true that uh, unlike the previous drafts, uh, this draft uh, is simpler. But when the main law becomes simpler, there will be the notifications which will come and we need to watch out for that and complications may come uh, subsequently. So we have to be alert to that. Now, this law was passed by Lok Sabha on 7th August, then Rajya Sabha by 9th August and assent was given on 11th August so that it went at a breakneck uh, speed and the date of applicability will be awaited now. Just to have a bird's eye view of this so, uh, law, um, it has uh, nine chapters, uh, more or less typical to any data protection law. After some primary uh, sections in which the definitions are there and the applicability clauses are there, the uh, act goes on to discuss about obligations of the data fiduciaries, then rights of data principles, then special provisions such as cross-border transfer restrictions and exemptions. Then it goes on to the administrative aspect of data protection board in the chapters five and six. It talks about grievance addressal, appeal mechanism and penalties and adjudication and uh, some miscellaneous aspects. Schedule uh, talks of the penalties. We will try to address these uh, things, but when we look at the law, we must remember that different people have different perspectives. If you see the newspapers, many times you get misled with the reports which are appearing from uh, there. But what I would like to say is there is always a legal perspective. 
which will look at the law to see uh, how does it protect privacy of an individual, whether it uh, uh, fulfills the requirements under the Puttaswamy judgment and so on. That is for people like Prashant Bhushan and others, privacy activists who are looking at that. In fact, they have a major exposure in the uh, media. So many times we think that something is totally wrong with the uh, act because uh, right to information has been uh, 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 affected or something like that. But these are all the legal perspective. These people will also be looking at the independence of DPB, uh, whether DPB is being constituted by the government, why can't it be constituted by the judiciary? These are the thoughts of uh, in this legal perspective, whether this will be a surveillance bill. So what I would like professionals like you is to steer clear of this kind of discussion, which is OK for a privacy activist. And for us in the industry, we have to look forward to what we need to do. So we need to look at the technology perspective and compliance perspective uh, because um, in compliance, we will be using technology. So we need to see how does automated processing uh, affect our activities, then whether profiling will be a problem uh, and whether uh, what is the responsibility of cloud op service providers and application developers. These are the things which we need to look at in terms of compliance. Of course, we have to see what are the obligations, what rights I have to prepare um, and whether I need to have a DPO, whether I need to have a DPIA. So these are the things which we need to look at. So I would like all technology professionals to focus on the technology perspective and compliance perfect, uh, perspective. Ignore the uh, various discussions which may happen in the media, which only disturbs us. Uh, many times I'm surprised when CISOs um, uh, try to uh, say something which a lawyer needs to say, okay, uh, that uh, this becomes a surveillance law. We are not bothered whether it is surveillance law or not. Um, that can be discussed on a separate platform. But what I am worried is if I am the CEO of the company, what I need to do to escape the possibility of penalty. So we need to focus on that. Now, the first aspect in this kind of a law is to look at the uh, applicability of the law. To whom does it apply? What are the rights of the data principles and what are the obligations? If you cover these three points, more or less the entire act is covered. Now, when we look at applicability, there again, I see some confusion in the marketplace. Um, uh, some uh, times we are getting confused. Is it applicable to a partnership firm? Is it applicable to a proprietary concern? Is it applicable to a company? Or is it applicable to only individuals? So here, what I would like to say is applicability has to be seen in two different contexts. OK, one is in terms of the privacy protection, it applies to individuals. That is the personal data of an individual. That is the data with which you can identify a person. That is the digital personal data. And this act applies to the digital personal data of an individual who will be referred to as a data principal and the uh, protection of his rights. Now, basic right is the privacy right, but in digital world, whatever this act talks about as the rights is what this particular Act tries to address. So this is one kind of applicability. Now, I cannot say it is not applicable to HUF, it is not applicable to a company, because when people see in the definitions uh, something called a person means a HUF, a partnership firm, they seem to misunderstand that if a person means a, a HUF or a company, then uh, the protection also should be available to data of companies. But this law is not meant to protect what can be called as non-personal data. Non-personal data has to be protected under Information Technology Act. Here, the need to look at person in the uh, perspective of an organization comes because one part of the applicability of this uh, law is on the obligations. The obligations appear uh, apply to 
the companies, uh, uh, partnership firms, societies, even governments, even education institutions, charitable institutions, all of them come as organizations. In fact, individuals who process other individuals' personal data for business purpose, they are also uh, being covered for obligation purpose. So we are looking at obligation purpose and protection purpose. And if we understand this, then we will know that the word person used in the law um, applies in two different contexts. We should not uh, confuse between the two. So having understood that, then if you look at the applicability, if personal data is processed in India, then all entities become uh, liable and for the particular act. Unless they are exempted, there is also a provision that individual data fiduciaries or types of classified uh, classifications of some data fiduciaries can be exempted by notification. Um, that is an, what we call as an empowering uh, provision, which the government at some point of time may use it. OK, uh, otherwise it includes even individuals for non-domestic purpose. Individuals using it for domestic purpose is exempt. Now NGOs, government, they are all there. We don't know in future whether some exemptions will be given to uh, uh, perhaps say religious institutions and others. You know that GDPR has some exemptions for religious institutions. So whether it is a Tirpati Devstanam or whether it's a church or whether it is a masjid. Now, all of these organizations hold personal data. Now, whether this law will apply to that or not um, will definitely be raised at some point of time. As of now, it is applicable. So even a, a work board will also have to deal with the DPDPA. Now, tomorrow some exemptions may be given, but as of now, no exemptions are there. Every organization which processes data in India will be subject to this data protection law. If somebody collects the information in um, non-digital form and processes it in non-digital form, this particular law does not address that. So suppose uh, you are having a physical register in which you are noting down certain things, then um, as long as you don't digitize it, it is outside this law. But if you digitize it, then automatically it comes under this law. Many people have been asking what about printouts? See, printouts are essentially coming out of electronic systems. So, so therefore, they are electronic documents per se. So therefore, they will come under the um, act. What may escape this particular uh, law, uh, perhaps uh, uh, welcome by the industries, is the visitors register you maintain at the uh, entry point where uh, that security person is noting down my name, my maybe my laptop uh, number or something like that, uh, maybe mobile number. So that is personal data. So right now that register is exempt from the act. Uh, but if the organization starts digitizing it and profiling the people who visit their organization, then they will be uh, inviting the application of this particular law. As far as personal data processed outside India, if the purpose of processing is related to offering goods and services to data principles in India, then it will come under this particular act. Again, a question comes, what if personal data is processed outside India, but it is related to other than this offering of goods and services? That will be outside this law, but it may come within the Information Technology Act. What has been specifically excluded is personal data processed for domestic purpose by individuals. And another interesting thing is about the data which is publicly available. It says that the act is not applicable, provided that publicly available data has been made public by the data principle. Now, when we say the data principle has made it public, it appears that there is already a consent for putting the data in public place for some kind of a purpose. For example, if you put your data in, let us say, uh, LinkedIn, 
uh, maybe your purpose uh, is uh, to actually develop your professional network, maybe for getting job opportunities. Now, whether that can be picked up and processed for, uh, say, uh, finding out your food habits or something like that, that obviously needs to be looked at as a different purpose. So purpose for which a person has placed data publicly becomes the guiding factor. If for the same purpose, if you want to use it, maybe it is within the particular um, uh, act uh, I mean, as an exemption. But uh, of course, you know that uh, whether it's LinkedIn or Twitter today, they will not allow for scrapping of data out of their uh, uh, platform unless it is permitted, which means that LinkedIn is becoming a data fiduciary which takes the consent of its members for sharing the information with others. Now, whether they do it for a price to only certain licenses or otherwise, that is different, but the purpose of, of sharing uh, permission has been granted to LinkedIn by the members and the other people may take, say, the purchase this particular uh, right. Uh, and in that process, they could be considered as joint fiduciaries, uh, joint data fiduciaries. See, when two entities are involved, one person this, uh, uses uh, the personal data and uh, determines the purpose and means of the use of personal data, we call him as a data fiduciary. Now, when he transfers it to another person, if the purpose of transfer is to carry out a processing under the subcontract uh, of between the two, then the second person will become a data processor and more or less data processor is uh, not liable for most of the things in data protection uh, laws, even penalties also are mostly directed to the data fiduciary. But there are many instances where data processors determine the means of processing. When they determine the means of processing because they will say that I have got a proprietary software, I will not share my source code with you, but you, but I will give you some um, insights uh, which are proprietary in nature, then they are taking the responsibility to determine the means of processing and therefore they become joint data fiduciaries. Most of the cloud application service providers also will fall into that category. So for an organization to be a pure data processor, he should be a person who simply does a contractual job of processing data as per the instructions of the data fiduciary, which has to be documented in a contract. So that is uh, how this act treats the different roles of people, uh, data fiduciary and data processor. And of course, data principal is the uh, person whom you would have otherwise uh, called as data subject. In between, there is a particular role which this organ, which this uh, law has. Sorry, yeah. sorry to interrupt, Navi sir. I think let's take a logical break and take some questions. There are a lot of interesting questions coming in chat, uh, but I would let people to raise their hand and ask question. Uh, is it yeah. okay to stop here, Navi sir, or do uh, yeah. you want to cover? I am okay. not actually looking at the chat box, so somebody will have to speak and uh, tell yeah, me about so that. Yeah, okay. so we'll not we'll not go to the questions which are put on the chat. Maybe I will share them offline with you, and then you can draft the response. But yeah. here I would like people to unmute themselves and ask questions. So uh, Roshan, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and ask question, please. And short question and short answers because we have limited time. Roshan, go ahead. Mr. Sudipta, go ahead, please. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, first of all, uh, Navi sir, uh, uh, thank you so much for all the great insights um, you have shared so far today on this, uh, you know, data, digital data production uh, law. Uh, now it's become a law. Uh, and I'm also, you know, like you, I'm also attending from Bangalore. Um, and my question is, uh, could you please uh, share your thoughts on how effectively CIO, CISO, and DPO should work together to make this entire you know function happen properly say compliance is a teamwork 
and um, different uh, uh, persons will have to join together. What we are proposing uh, in our PDP CSI uh, framework is that the organization should first of all create a governance committee which will have the representations from uh, all business uh, divisions, including marketing, finance, CFO also should be there, CISO also should be there, CTO also should be there. If you have a CRO, let him also be there. DPO also will be there. So it is this governance committee which has to uh, ensure that there is um, exchange of information, uh, mutual cooperation, and when directions are to be issued uh, to different departments, so say DPO cannot issue any uh, direction to let us say CISO. So it has to be brought into this particular uh, forum and that forum will have to actually uh, take a view and CEO also or if not a CEO, even an independent director should be made part of this governance committee. And uh, if you have such a setup, then it is possible to bring in this harmonious uh, relationship between the CIOs and the uh, DPO. Okay, yeah. Uh, thanks, sir. So do you think that so because uh, one one question at a time, please? We don't have yeah. time for all the questions. Uh, sure, I'm yes. sorry. We'll move to the next question. Uh, Mr. Tejas, ask your question, please. Yeah, uh, good morning, sir. So I go back to your slide, uh, which basically spoke about the applicability. And there was a last bullet which stated that uh, it, this law is applicable to the data which is collected in digital form or collected in manually, but converted into digital form. Uh, though in today's world, uh, my question is a little uh, irrelevant, but more from uh, academics perspective. If an organization is collecting the data in a manual form and retaining in the manual form, as I said, maybe irrelevant in today's world. Does this law, uh, uh, is this law applicable to them? No, I gave you one small example of a visitor's register. If after that, if you dump it in your go down, then it is uh, collected digitally and stored digitally. Okay. So that will be outside this particular uh, law. It should be handled, if at all any infringement uh, or uh, data theft of that is there, it has to be handled um, uh, under IPC, okay? But if it is digitized in some form, then it will automatically come into this particular uh, law, okay? Okay, thank you so much. Cool, Mr. Srinivas, your question now, please. Good morning, Mr. Vijay. Uh, so I have a quick question, like uh, what GDPR recommends, like um, the uh, the data uh, can be uh, deleted or removed, you know, by the individual people based on the request. Is, is this something part of this new law also? Uh, yeah, I will come to that in a subsequent uh, slide. Erasure of data. OK, Good. withdrawal of consent, erasure of data. Or completion of the purpose of processing, then there is an obligation to delete also. That is, uh, erasure comes in two places. One is if I am processing some, I have collected some data for a particular purpose and that purpose is no longer required, I am under an obligation to delete that particular data. Or if the uh, data principle specifically asks me to withdraw uh, consent, uh, he has withdrawn the consent, at ask me to delete the consent, then it is a request for erasure coming from him. Both are possible, but in Indian context, we don't equate it to the right to forget in GDPR. So it is all subject to the uh, uh, evaluation of the organization that the data is not otherwise required under any legitimate purpose. So I always suggest that if there is a request for erasure, request for withdrawal of consent immediately like in the case of a data breach you conduct an internal audit here also an internal committee should immediately go into the fact that can we delete this data and it has to document its reasons why it can delete the data it's no longer required by my finance department it is no longer required by marketing department it is no longer required for income tax purpose so i have now recommended to companies that they should bring this request for erasure to this governance committee and get the governance committee's approval before going ahead with the erasure. It should not be done routinely. Now, I have received a request, let me delete it. That should never be done in the Indian context because there are requirements under Information Technology Act sometimes. So it is possible that 
the data may have to be retained under Information Technology Act for six months or say five years. So you cannot automatically take a view that only one angle will be seen. Somebody sends you an email and then you uh, uh, perhaps uh, remove it. And also this act says that in case that withdrawal of consent is there and it disrupts your activity to the extent that there is a cost to the organization to stop processing, then the consequences of that in terms of financial uh, loss and other things, the data principal who is withdrawing the consent should be held responsible. So consent WAPSI is not accepted under our law. In fact, this is another thing which the industry should appreciate that you will, you cannot be taken for ride by a group of people who will suddenly come to you and say you withdraw. I withdraw my consent at that time if it may uh, have a cost for you. So there is some discipline which is sought to be imposed even on the data principles in this particular law. OK. Great. I Thank think it's interest, in the interest of time, let's continue with this session and we will take more questions at the end. So over to you, Navi, sir. OK, so there are two points which I want to mention here. One is in, if you see the last uh, part of the slide about data principle, it says in the case of a child, which is a minor, the term data principle includes the parents. So it is more or less like a joint data principle, the child and the parents. This has got some advantages in compliance because suppose a person is a minor today and tomorrow at 12 o'clock in the night he becomes a major. Now the question for the organization is until today I am taking the consent of the parent from tomorrow parental consent actually uh, becomes um, uh, unacceptable, which means that I have to stop processing and seek the consent of the data principle. Now this particular uh, uh, transition from an erstwhile minor to a current uh, major requires transition of the consent from the parent to the um, uh, erstwhile minor who has now become a major and probably this definition of data principle to some extent brings a kind of uh, continuity of that process because even before the minor became a major whatever I was processing was that of the parent, that is the information of the parent, that is the information of the minor is actually the information of the parent. Therefore, when the cutoff date passes, it is only a question of best practice that I need to replace, but there is no legal um, uh, incongruence. I think that is something which is exclusive to our law. You will not find this in um, GDPR or other things. Second aspect is this role of a consent manager. This particular act envisages that between the data fiduciary and the uh, data principal, one layer of service is being envisaged. There will be organizations called consent managers who are also data fiduciaries. They will be registered under a separate set of rules and regulations, and they will be act as trusted repositories of personal data. They are acting on behalf of the data principles, not on behalf of the data fiduciaries. So the data principles will trust a particular organization, give their information to them and tell them that you please give consent to my services. You please withdraw consent whenever it is required. So that is an intermediary which will provide consent at the request of a data principle or withdraw consent at his uh, request and uh, that is a new category of uh, organizations which will be coming up. A lot of discussions happen on this. In fact, even today in navi.org, I have posted one article based on whatever we discussed yesterday with uh, the minister and uh, others. So you can look at uh, that for additional information. Another important point which you can note in this particular act is Earlier we used to have a classification of data as personal data, uh, I mean um, critical personal data, sensitive personal data and so on. But now there is no mention of that classification um, uh, such as sensitive personal data or critical personal data. But instead the government may say I will classify the data of fiduciaries itself as significant data fiduciaries and others. And when they are trying to 
designate some data of fiduciary as a significant data of fiduciary apart from taking the volume into consideration volume of data process sensitivity sensitivity of personal data is also being taken into account then risk to the rights of the data principle then potential impact on the sovereignty and integrity of data risk to electoral democracy security of the state and public order these all any or all of these things can be the criteria under which significant data fiduciaries may be uh, decided therefore the definition of sensitive personal data in a way is subsumed by the definition of a significant data fiduciary that is if earlier there was something called a critical data like a dna data or aadhar data now irrespective of the volume i may say that any organization which is processing aadhar data will be considered as a significant data fiduciary even if they are having only 100 such data they become a significant data fiduciary something like that what will happen is the definition of significant data fiduciary will itself become a substitute for defining sensitive personal uh, data i think uh, that is um, what is happening and these significant data fiduciaries apart from the general obligations will have three specific obligations which is that they have to appoint a data protection officer they have to appoint an independent data auditor and they have to undertake periodical dpia periodical audit and any other measure so these will be additional obligations which the significant data fiduciary has to follow otherwise the general obligations applicable to all organizations which are uh i uh, uh, processing personal data and determining the means and purpose will be this set that is one is these data fiduciaries will be responsible for compliance of this act fully so from uh, uh, say section 1 to section 44 these people are responsible and any rules and other things also they are responsible okay they will have a valid contract whenever data is transferred to a data processor and as regards the quality of data so in gdpr we are all used to thinking about data minimization data quality or something like that here it is not stated in the same order or same requirement but uh, differently uh, purpose oriented collection is there even uh, here so within that purpose most of the data processing principles will be included uh, as regarding the maintenance of the accuracy of data this act says that it is more important when data is used either for decision making or disclosure uh, otherwise suppose you have collected some data 3 years back and uh, you are not using it for any decision making or disclosure you have used it for some report within your organization you are not required to go back and uh, try to update that data but if you are using it for some decision making today or you are going to disclose it to some third parties uh, as personal data of xyz then uh, there is a need for updation and maintaining the completeness and accuracy then the normal aspect of um, appropriate technical and organizational measures which is the entire compliance uh, aspect is a responsibility of all data fiduciaries implement appropriate technical and organizational measures to be compliant so to be compliant with sections 1 to section 44 whatever organizational and technical measures are required that is an obligation of all data fiduciaries including those who are not significant data fiduciaries then specifically mentioned uh, uh, obligation is take reasonable security safeguards which is important even where some other exemptions are there notification of data breach details of which uh, uh, how quickly and other things so you have to wait for the notification then uh, the processing of personal data has to be done only for a lawful purpose with the consent there are two aspects consent and legitimate use earlier we used to uh, use a term called deemed consent now deemed consent has been replaced with legitimate use so it is mandatory that there has to be either a consent or it should fall under legitimate use which means that from compliance point of view you need to have a specific policy to address these issues now notice is required 
And one of the aspects uh, which this has added is that notice has to be given in 22 registered uh, languages in India, which are uh, there in our constitution. And uh, therefore, the um, some kind of an arrangement has to be made if a person requires the notice to be delivered to him in any of these uh, languages. So uh, it is not clear whether you should post 22 pages of privacy policy. Instead of that, what may be required is that if a person says that my language preference is so, so and so, then the uh, uh, privacy notice has to be given in that particular uh, language. Then establishing of a uh, grievance redressal system is a very important aspect. Then, of course, uh, business contact information of the data protection uh, officer um, is also there. I already covered this point that if there are no other compulsions of law, then erase or cause it to be erased uh, obligation is there when consent is withdrawn or the purpose is completed. OK. Now, uh, special aspects of the consent, as I said, it has to be in all the scheduled languages and of course it can be withdrawn by the data principle and uh, still they are talking of uh, the uh, consent being in the nature of an agreement. When they use the term agreement, you know, contract act requires an authentication, a signature. So digital signature is required in India. So most of the time we are not taking digital signature. We are taking a click wrap consent and uh, that will uh, always be weak in uh, law. If any organization has a business proposition which has got a high monetary value, it is better to take consent with some kind of a uh, authentication like the e-sign, which is not very uh, expensive. And consequences of withdrawal um, will have to be borne by the data principle. <clears throat> As far as children's data is concerned, um, the verifiable consent of a parent of the child is required. Um, and uh, there should be an avoidance of uh, profiling and um, any behavioral uh, monitoring of the children or even the targeted advertising directed at the children. Exemptions may be possible. Earlier exemptions were specified like uh, counseling centers who deal with uh, child abuse or something like that. So similar exemptions may be provided uh, through notification saying that these kind of organizations can process children's data, can profile children's uh, because that is part of their uh, obligation to provide advice on child abuse and so on. Then coming to this legitimate use, this is another very important aspect for compliance people. I want you to focus on legitimate use and exemptions because otherwise you know that uh, whenever you are uh, handling personal data, I am liable, but exemptions are there and legitimate users are there and these are in a way um, some kind of a, uh, point which you can use for strategizing your business. Uh, if you tomorrow say I want to monetize my business, otherwise why should I be in the business? Then look at the legitimate use, look at uh, the obtaining of the consent and um, also the exemptions. Now, what are the legitimate use? One is processing can be done for purposes for which data principle has voluntarily provided the uh, information. Um, Secondly, for availing any benefits of the state, which is a government related activity, performance of government functions, it is also a government activity. Then fulfilling legal obligation and complying with the judgments, this, also, this may apply to the private organizations. For meeting medical emergency, this also may apply to the uh, private organization. For taking measures to ensure safety during disaster or breakdown of law. So, accepting this performance of government functions and legal obligations, the rest of the things can um, um, apply in the uh, case of individual uh, companies. Uh, then for employment purpose, it, this has been used as a legitimate use, which is again some welcome uh, step as far as industry is concerned, because most of the industries uh, process personal information of people before 
they are onboarded as employees. And then, of course, during employment and after termination for some more years, their data becomes relevant. So if something can be said as required for the purpose of employment, which uh, includes the assessment of the person and so on, then um, that is a legitimate use, which means that maybe prior consent, if it is not there also, you can still escape. Second is related to safeguarding the employer from loss or liability, such as prevention of corporate espionage, maintenance of confidentiality of trade secrets, intellectual property, or classified information or provision of any service for the benefit sought by the data principal as an employee, like uh, the insurance for family and so on. In those cases also, it is considered a legitimate use. So if there is a surveillance of employees for whatever reason, for the purpose of information security or monitoring a person's behavior outside the office to understand any fraud um, tendencies and other things, you can bring it under legitimate use. But my advice is have an appropriate policy of legitimate use. In our PDPSI, we recommend there should be a separate employee privacy policy. We cannot have the same privacy policy for external personal data uh, suppliers like uh, the customers and the employees because employees are a privileged persons uh, who are provided with lot more confidential information of the company. Um, and therefore, it is, uh, in my opinion, very legitimate to expect that I have a greater power to control any breach of corporate information by the employees. Therefore, there should be a separate privacy policy for employees, and that can take care of some of uh, these things. Um, whether it is uh, uh, feasible or not, you should check with your HR department. I would definitely say that you should develop a privacy policy and take the acknowledgement of all your uh, staff so that tomorrow they will not come up and say why the CCTV camera is focusing on me or why you are following, I mean, uh, trying to monitor my bank uh, uh, transactions and so on. I'm not saying that it, privacy should be infringed, but uh, I, under what circumstances you can take a little more license to have surveillance on the employees can be put into a policy uh, statement. There is legitimate use. There are certain obligations uh, which are exempted. But remember that even in the category of um, the exempted things which I'm going to uh, read out now, not all obligations are exempted. For example, in the overall obligations, there is one responsibility which is about the responsibility about subcontracting. That is the responsibility of the processor is that of the data fiduciary. Now that cannot be exempted. Similarly, protection of data from confidentiality, integrity and availability uh, perspective, that cannot be exempted. Rights of protection, cross-border transfer restrictions, if any, they are not exempted, but excluding this, certain other obligations can be exempted when there is a need to enforce a legal right, when there is a judicial order or for law enforcement purposes by the uh, police, then uh, necessary for mergers or trans transfer of undertaking, provided the uh, merger has already been approved by the court. Before approval of the court, there is no exemption, but after approval of the court, the exemption uh, could be uh, used uh, under this law. Then processing of information of defaulters for ascertaining assets and liabilities of a financial institution is basically aimed at helping organizations for credit recovery. So organizations which are called financial institutions by definition, that definition you have to go to NCLT, you have to perhaps refer RBI uh, Act also. Uh, if you come under the definition of the financial institution under these laws, then it is possible for you to actually um, uh, 
uh, use an exemption, provided you also record that he's a defaulter. A person before he becomes a defaulter doesn't come under this particular provision. A defaulter of a financial institution, then processing of information is something like earlier we used to use the term credit recovery. So this is a, a particular requirement under credit uh, recovery. OK, then processing of personal data of data principles not within the territory of India under a contract. This is an important uh, aspect which is applicable to the BPOs. Now, if you are a data processor and uh, the vendor is a GDPR compliant person and he has entered into a contract uh, with you and the data is not that of uh, Indian data principles, it is the foreign data principles. So processing of personal data of data principles outside India being processed within India geographically within India under a contract that is exempt from the uh, provisions of uh, the act accepting these couple of things which I mentioned, that is you cannot subcontract it and say that I don't have a responsibility that is not there and CIA protection that is a responsibility for uh, the uh, uh, safety of uh, the data. Then uh, as far as the rights are concerned, this may not apply for this case because we are talking of uh, rights of foreign uh, principles who are anyway that should be covered under the contract. Cross border transfer also may not arise because we are talking of an incoming data here. We are not talking of an outgoing data. So whatever other obligations which somebody may say should apply here, some exemptions are given for the BPOs. Otherwise on cross border transfer, this is very um, open. It says government will notify a list of restricted countries until such time it is uh, free. Now, Penalties, there are list of penalties uh, for different things like um, breach of obligation, data breach notification not notified, uh, then uh, this minus data not being handled properly kind of a thing. The penalty will extend up to 250 crores for a type of uh, a breach. This doesn't mean that the maximum penalty is only 250 crores. In fact, earlier it said in the earlier version, it said 500 crores as a maximum, but now there is no maximum, which means that this 250 crores can be multiplied by the number of breaches. Uh, the minister uh, Rajiv Chandrasekhar has repeatedly said uh, in public forum that if there are 10,000 data uh, sets breached, then the penalty can even go up to 10,000 into 250 crores may or may not be to that extent, but what he is trying to indicate is that there is no maximum limit. So if people say that uh, Google's and others will simply pay 250 crores and do whatever they want, that will not happen. Uh, the penalties can go much beyond 250 crores. They may even merge multiple types of breaches here, like not uh, uh, having a uh, breach notification and also not uh, being in compliance, so 250 crores plus 200 crores like that, they may look at it or they may look at the volume of data breach and then perhaps uh, go for higher levels of penalty. One of the things which you may mention uh, note here is the item number five, which says 10,000 rupees. This is applicable to the data principles who are not fulfilling their duties such as they should not file a false complaint, they should not impersonate and they should be law compliant. So there are certain duties which are there for the data principles and if they violate those duties and make a false complaint, the uh, board, data protection board has a right to impose a penalty up to the extent of 10,000 on them. There is no um, so I'll say I, I will skip this data protection board and other things. If you have any specific questions, I will come back to that. Um, one other aspect people have been asking is that we call this as a data protection law, 
but uh, we have a 10,000 rupees penalty for the data principle. Where is the compensation for the data principle? In fact, many people are saying that data principle will make a complaint and government will appropriate 250 crores uh, to its kitty. It should not be considered like that. This particular act is aimed at disciplining the data fiduciaries. So it is a, having that limited objectives. In that sense, when a data principal makes a complaint, he is assisting the government to ensure that the system is clean. It is like in the case of criminal offenses, if you make a complaint of a cognizable offense, it doesn't mean that the uh, court will give you a compensation, even if you are the victim. That victim compensation is handled differently. Uh, and the complainant in a criminal case becomes the witness to a particular act and then he will uh, uh, assist the court in finding out the culprit and then uh, the culprit will be punished so that it will be a deterrence for others. A similar principle is there here that a data principle may be one of the persons who may make a complaint. The complaints can also flow in from various other uh, sources and the data protection board will conduct an inquiry and impose the uh, penalty. So compensation to data principles, there is a provision in the act that the board may issue directions as may be appropriate. So it is possible that the board may tell the data fiduciary, which is found as uh, erring, to pay some compensation to the data principle. But even if it is not there, I personally feel that compensation by data principles has to be claimed under the Information Technology Act. Just as in the case of a criminal offense, you file a criminal complaint so that the police will punish the culprit. You go to a civil court to claim your damages. Like in all the case of uh, bank frauds, we are uh, going to the adjudicator for recovery of our loss and the police will pursue the uh, criminal uh, case. Similar um, aspect uh, is there in this particular law also. Okay. Um, then uh, the section 43 capital A of Information Technology Act will stands now actually abolished. So that is not there. So this compensation which I said can be claimed under ITA 2000 has to be done under section 43. So Many people are again confused. 43A has gone. There is no compensation there. Where should I claim? There is a section 43, which is linked to section 66, which is a criminal offense. Any kind of loss which a person has suffered in terms of data will automatically become a violation of section 43. Um, and therefore, that uh, particular aspect remains. Now, this um, RTI thing is uh, actually there is nothing great there. It only says uh, that uh, if an RTA request is there and the commissioner uh, has to take a decision, if any release of personal data is involved, then there is no need to uh, release that uh, data. So privacy actually takes a precedence in terms of the right to information. Right to information, people can get their information without the personal data. Maybe even anonymized uh, information can be provided, but if somebody wants the name of a person who, who is to be uh, provided in the RTI uh, reply, that may not happen. So this is uh, generally, I think, uh, uh, what uh, is uh, uh, the uh, basic content of this uh, uh, law. Uh, we can go into any further questions uh, here, okay? Great, great session, Navisar, as always. Thank you very much for taking out time for this. Uh, let's go for Q&A. So, Mr. Alok, go ahead and ask your question, please. Uh, 